So thank you, Elizabeth, for coming on the show. Uh, we are obviously approaching the 10-year anniversary of the Sandy Hook shootings. And I wanted to get your thoughts. What made you decide to want to write this book on Sandy Hook, an American tragedy and the battle over truth? What lessons uh, were you drawing from it and what, what journey were you taking about revisiting it uh, nearly a decade later? So when the, the first lawsuits against Alex Jones were filed in the middle of 2018, they kind of dropped at a moment that was really kind of a, um, a flexion point in the culture. You know, it was the beginning of the Trump era. Um, we were already accustomed to this idea of post-truth um, and, um, and alternative facts and things like that. And I was thinking, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't really know very much about what had happened to the families. You know, I might have heard a little bit about conspiracy theories. My first introduction to Alex Jones was during the campaign in 2016. Um, I didn't know a lot about him myself before that. I was not a you know regular listener to his show, yeah. um, but. Um, I just thought that this was a very interesting test of the First Amendment on both sides. On um, Jones's side, does this protect the kind of you know harmful speech, the 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 theories that are you know drawing um, people out of the woodwork to come after these families and to torment them? And on the family side, you know where do you draw the line? You know, do you um, what type of speech is okay because it's a public event? And, and what type of speech is genuinely harmful and, um, and you know, stirs up a mob and creates all kinds of, um, of problems for them and for their families. And in the book, you describe a lot of your conversations both with the family and families involved and also with Alex Jones himself. So kind of taking them one at a time, can yeah. you describe the process of getting to know the families and how the misinformation from Alex Jones affected them? Yeah, so the first thing I did was um, I went to Houston and I talked with the lawyers who had filed the cases for um, um, on behalf of um, Lenny Posner and Veronique De La Rosa, um, who are the parents of Noah, who is the youngest Sandy Hook victim, and Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, who are the parents of Jesse Lewis, um, who also died in his Sandy Hook classroom. So um, I talked with them and they actually brokered the introduction with the families for the first time. Um, so I spoke with Veronique first. Um, it took me, and then I spoke with Neil. Um, I spoke with Scarlett and it took me a little while to get to know Lenny who actually is the central character in the book because he was a, um, a little bit wary. He didn't know what I really wanted to speak about. And, um, and so it took a little while before he was ready to talk with me, a couple months maybe. So that was sort of my first introduction to the families. And he's really been through the ringer from your book makes very much clear what was the most yeah. surprising thing in learning about the blowback in terms of these conspiracy theories and Sandy Hook trutherism, how it affected him and his family? I think probably one of the key things that shocked me and surprised me was how many times he'd had to move. Um, at the time I first talked with him, he'd had to move house about a half dozen times because, and so had Veronique, because um, I mean, they live, they're divorced, they live in separate households, um, but they would move in tandem because they're parenting uh, Noah's twin and, um, and, their, and her older sister. Um, so that was one of the things, every time that he would move to a new place, somebody would post his address and his personal information online and he would feel unsafe and have to move again. So they kept moving around um, just, to, just to stay, as Lenny puts it, a step ahead of the hoaxers. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a pretty shocking thing. Obviously, one of the things that's a matter of public record that most people know about is the fact that um, in 2016, um, a woman was making death threats, leaving uh, messages for him. She ended up uh, being jailed for that in 2017. Um, 
just the, the, the way that people hound him. Um, and every time he tries to get this content taken down, it just gets worse. You know, it just becomes um, intensified because once you break into these chains of, of hoaxers and their kind of world that they live in, um, then you're a real threat to them. Um, and the reaction is pretty vicious. And one thing that is a running theme in your book is how Alex Jones got fringe academics to give the theories a kind of patina of intellectual respectability. How, how can you describe how these fringe academics got involved? Sure. So one of the first ones, in fact, a person who began to call the families crisis actors was a guy named James Tracy, who spoke, who um, was a teacher of journalism, uh, no less, at um, Florida Atlantic University. So he had a little blog called Memory Hall. Not a lot of people paid attention to it, um, but he first started to speculate about the, he had, there was a company that was actually called Crisis Actors that would supply people for like a drill of some kind. So, you know, if you needed to do um, a disaster drill or something like that, they would, they would bring people onto the scene and they would actually set up a phony event so that first responders could practice their response and you know everybody could could sort of test their systems for evacuation or what have you. So he latched on to this company and said, ah, there's my smoking gun. You know, the, these people are supplying crisis actors to Sandy Hook um, and started to speculate about that. Um, Anderson Cooper found out about it and did two consecutive shows on James Tracy and people in general who, uh, who were conspiracy theorizing around Sandy Hook because he spent a lot of time in Newtown. And one of those individuals that they were also speculating about was Veronique because she did an interview with Cooper um, in downtown Newtown, which Alex Jones latched onto and said, because there was a glitch in the video reproduction of the interview that he showed on his show, he was speculating wrongly, of course, that it was filmed in front of a green screen and that um, she had faked her interview in a CNN studio. Mm -hmm. um, so he was the first academic. Another one was James Fetzer in Wisconsin who um, compiled the work of six different PhDs um, who, and also another half dozen people um, into a 400 page book called um, subtly, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook. Um, and they sold that on Amazon. Um, Lenny and others had that taken down from Amazon. That was a self-published um, you know, tome that they sold on Amazon. And then they put the PDF of the book online for free and it was downloaded 10 million times. Um, so, and he was constantly touting, he is a former University of Minnesota professor. He uses his status as a Knight Professor Emeritus to file amicus briefs in these defamation suits against Jones, for example. Um, his CV is still on their website. He still uses his EDU email address. So he really um, generates a lot of credence for himself just by his association with the university. And they don't seem able to stop him. Um, so he's another. Um, there's another one out of Berkeley, um, Maria Sha Chang, who um, had been a, um, a teacher in, um, at the University of Nevada at Reno. Um, she's since retired, but she had a whole blog called Fellowship of the Minds in which she speculated all day long about the Sandy Hook families and in fact put all of their personal information, including the children's birth dates, their parents' addresses online because she was speculating that they had been paid to participate in the event. And you actually confronted her, correct? I did, yes. I called her up and she was pretty freaked out. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, but we spent a long time talking and I did kind of manage to bring her around a little bit to say, you know, do you really think this is okay? Because she even acknowledged that she put all this information on her website and then she invited people to speculate saying, so here's all their information. This is what I was able to find as a matter of public record, which in itself is a little scary that you could find that much material on these families. Um, and then I don't really know what this is, but hey, everybody, why don't you go out and find out? Which is a little bit like what Alex Jones does, right? right. You know, 
everybody go and investigate, you know, be a citizen journalist, investigate for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, these people get get folks showing up in their driveway, um, calling them on their phones, accosting their children, um, turning up at memorial events for their dead loved ones. Um, So it's really a a, a pernicious, obnoxious thing. And yeah, so I did uh, I did confront her about that. And she acknowledged because she had since been doxxed herself that Mm. this was. Um, oh, actually really inconvenient because then people know where you are and they call you up. Well, this had been going on for eight years by the time I brought this to her attention. So um, it was a little bit like, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. um, you'd mentioned the crisis actor conspiracy theory, um, which yeah. the company itself uh, had was forced to speak out and say, hey, this has nothing to do with us and stop exploiting the Sandy Hook tragedy. Exactly. It's interesting. You talk about how uh, Jones's really cagey reaction to it in terms of how very often he would attribute it as though, you know, he's just asking questions and pretend that he did not actually espouse the theory, but you quote him blatantly actually espousing this child actor theory. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that was kind of uh, interesting to me is that, you know, he was constantly saying that he was repeating the claims of others, that he didn't come up with these things himself. But if you go back and you actually listen to his shows from that time, on the first day, he was starting to come up with theories around this. And he did hatch a lot of his own theories. It's true, he did use these people like Fetzer, a really pernicious guy, Wolfgang Halbig, who's based down in Florida, who made two dozen trips to Newtown with an InfoWars camera crew in tow. Um, Those people were content providers to him, that is true. But he definitely came up with these theories on his own, including one about Noah Posner um, speculating that because someone after um, a massacre of 130, you know, uh, people in a school, most of them children in Peshawar, Pakistan, um, someone was carrying Noah's picture on a placard um, at a demonstration in Peshawar. They were probably doing this in solidarity with children who had been killed at school all over the world. But they spread this theory that, oh, Noah has died twice now at Sandy Hook and then in Peshawar. Um, That was, original content of Jones's that originated on InfoWars. And that was um, something that Lenny had taken down, which really ignited um, the ongoing battle with Jones. And you interviewed Jones yourself. Can you talk to me about that? What was that like speaking to him, knowing, you know, everything that you knew uh, going in about his involvement with the Sandy Hook families? Sure. So I had actually, that was a really strange uh, week. It was in 2018, really when I kind of embarked on this project. So there was a first hearing in the, um, in the Posner case uh, in a courtroom in Austin where Jones is based, um, where InfoWars has its um, operation. And, the, and I went and I interviewed his ex-wife, Kelly Jones, um, I went to the hearing and she told me when I interviewed her that um, they had a hearing in family court the day after the hearing in the Posner case. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go because I I know he'll be there and I'll just see, you know, if he'll talk with me because he had, he had not been responding to my contact efforts. So um, he agreed. uh, Well, he, he agreed. He said, you know, call me. um, And then I got into uh, an Uber and um, and I called him from the Uber. I had his address of his headquarters. He likes to say that it's secret, that um, no one knows where InfoWars is based. But when I got in the Uber and I gave the address, the driver said, oh, that's Alex Jones's operation. I used to drive for UPS. And, and oh, they all think it's so secret. Uh, but of course it wasn't. <laughs> it's was just like, Oh yeah, the secret uh, headquarters of Infowars. So he drove me to right outside, and I called him. And to my surprise, he said, "All right, come on in. Um, you know, we'll talk." 
Um, so, so we talked for a couple hours, more than two hours, I think. And then he called me the next day because he wanted to clarify a few things and he talked for an hour or two more. Um, he tried to say that, that um, talking with, you know, I was doing it for the paper at the time. So talking with the times, this would be the hill he dies on, that if I can't portray him fairly and accurately, that was going to be it, you know, but I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to see what comes out the other side. Mm -hmm. So, um, so he, he was very on, it was a little bit like watching his show. Um, <laughs> When we were talking on the phone the next day, he was a, a little bit different. He was he was performing actually for Rob Dew, who was in uh, one of his top lieutenants, who was in the meeting as well. Um, so he's a he's a very needy, you know, attention seeking person. Um, I think some of the stuff uh, he says he believes. I think a lot of it is is you know just sort of all presentation and you know, trying to, to shock me, he was trying to intimidate me, he was trying to, to act like, you know, raise things like, you know, did the CIA send me and these sort of cliched kind of things. Um, but it was, you know, it, it was revealing in its way, because um, you could tell that he was starting to get pretty concerned about these lawsuits that this and he was also a bit rattled about family court too. So it was kind of an interesting moment to interview him because I think he was probably a little more vulnerable feeling than he might be normally. And of course he ultimately lost that lawsuit. Um, oh, you, okay. I remember one part of your interview, there was this great line uh, where you said, are you always like this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is dinner at the um, at the Jones uh, family homestead like? <laughs> you know, because it did seem and people who work with him say that, you know, it, it is a little bit how he is, you know, 24 seven, he'd call them in the middle of the night, for example, and say, you know, he he'd, he'd be like, come on over and bring a camera, I need you to film me. And he had a rant in mind. They'd get there, he'd have, he'd have gone out again, you know, to the bars or whatever. And then they'd sit around his house waiting for him to turn up. This is in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So they would call him the, the energy vampire because he's just always on. Um, he is, and, and you know, you've seen him, he is genuinely riveting as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, which is which adds to the danger of what he's saying because if you do tend to believe these things, he's a very engaging person to to spread them. Right, and that goes to one of the questions, that, actually topics I wanted to move toward is the how the book goes into how a lot of this becomes a harbinger of things to come and you draw certain connections between Pizzagate and yeah. Sandy Hook, how information worked in both instances and the same cast of characters in that and January 6th. Can you talk about yeah. discovering those connections and any that may have surprised you? Yeah, so when I first started working on the book, I saw it as more narrowly focused than it turned out because I thought, you know, these court cases and the First Amendment issues raised by them and just the characters involved would be, you know, pretty much the book. But then as I started reporting this, different things started happening, including COVID. And then all the same group of people, it was like lemmings, they just sort of migrated over to coronavirus and it was anti-masks and you know the China flu and and just the flu and you know so for example one of them this this guy Robert David Steele who actually was a former CIA officer um, died of COVID while denying it um, so they just sort of migrated unmasked from that to the 2020 um, election lie um, it's and that was an interesting thing that I learned in doing the book is it's not that politics is so much a predictor of somebody's sort of imbibing these conspiracy theories. It's really their own individual mindset. There's an element of narcissism. Um, someone wants to be in possession of superior knowledge. That's, that's the conspiracy theorist. They know what you don't. And if you're not going to be enlightened, then that's kind of on you. Um, so that's one aspect. The other is, is this idea of um, really deep distrust in our institutions, whether it's the media or the government. 
And then that sort of seeking, that sort of isolation, because a lot of these theories are pretty wild. So these people do tend to isolate themselves from friends and family who don't share their mindset. So now you have the internet that allows them to find each other online. This might have been the person in the corner of your family reunion who will buttonhole you about the JFK assassination or something like that, or, or you know, in the old days, sort of um, passing out, you know, photocopied sheets on the subway. But now that isolated person is no longer so. They find each other and they congregate online. And, you know, I was talking with Kara Swisher and she was saying, you know, we were talking about how the first Facebook groups were built around quilting and knitting. And that is exactly how the, the Sandy Hook hoax group, whose chat I, I cover where Lenny enters their chat to try and dissuade them. They're like a quilting circle. So they take an event and they start to just build and, and embroider and put the whole thing together until they have this wild, crazy quilt of, you know, like Lenny calls it a conspiracy blob where it can sort of morph and take in any alternate fact, turn it around, come up with the theory around that and add it to the quilt. So, um, so that's why they're so resistant because it's a social formation for them as well. Mm. And specifically those passages that you're describing in the book when Lenny uh, infiltrates these groups. And yeah. that I found that so riveting because he's there and they are so resistant to hearing, even hearing his story. And they yeah. are so, they attack him for yeah. trying to tell them about his profound loss. Can you describe learning about these chats? Yeah, from, yeah. From Lenny? So, um, so Lenny was good enough to, and he also has a, um, a researcher for his nonprofit called the Honor Network. Um, and that was a group of volunteers that would just hunt down this content, try and get it taken down, try and debunk. Early on, they tried to debunk what these conspiracy theorists were saying. They realized that that was just not going to work. They're absolutely impervious to facts. And that's really what you're referring to, Adam. So he goes into the Sandy Hook hoax group, this Facebook group online. And the, initially, they seemed sympathetic. We're sorry for your loss. You know, um, this must be terrible. Some of them may have believed, some of them maybe didn't. They didn't know, they had different theories. Um, but the whole thing just starts rolling downhill because he wasn't providing the, the kind of emotion that they thought they were looking for. That, you know, if he were a truly grieving father, he would be more emotional. Um, he wouldn't provide them uh, a copy of, you know, um, his birth certificate or some kind of documentation that they were looking for. Um, they just started getting really hostile. And there were one or two of them that were really kind of the ringleaders of that and the others followed suit. But you could see them kind of piling on in a sort of playground game where you know, one, one would level a charge, the other ones would jump on. They'd start to congratulate each other on really landing one on this grieving father. But at the same time, there were people um, direct messaging Lenny and he was contacting them and he was inviting them to come and chat with him. If, if he felt like they were somewhat sympathetic or they were somewhat on the fence or they were open to persuasion, he was inviting them to come separately and join a group that he ended up calling um, Conspiracy Theorists Anonymous. And he started to actually bring those people over and many of them became his first volunteers in the Honor Network, um, including a lot of young moms that really didn't wanna believe that this had happened initially. Uh -huh. so, can you talk about, obviously, they won their litigation pretty recently. Yeah. The, what were some of the successes of this even hitting the legal process and drawing out certain things onto the public record and also potentially threatening uh, Alex Jones's empire in its ledgers. In discovery. Yeah. 
Um, so from the beginning, Alex Jones was really resistant to any form of disclosure. And that is what ultimately cost him these lawsuits. But just to back up for a second. So he went into these, of course, claiming that the First Amendment protects all of this speech, that this was all about freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Um, and he was going to fight these cases to the bitter end because he was going to be a champion of free speech. But what he ended up doing was ignoring court orders and stymieing the process to the point where in four separate lawsuits, so three in Texas um, by the parents of two victims and one bigger one um, by the parents of uh, eight more, or not parents, but the family members of eight more in Connecticut, he so gummed up the process that he was defaulted in all of those cases. So he was held liable by default because he just didn't comply with discovery. He didn't turn up for depositions. Um, he didn't produce documents. Um, he sent people to testify, you know, the, the sort of designated corporate agent, how does your business run to your point? You know, how, how do you, how much money do you make? How much money did you make by spreading the Sandy Hook theory um, or theories? Um, how much did you spend on sending, you know, cameras out to cover this? Um, he wouldn't produce a lot of these records, most of this material. And so they ended up defaulting him. They couldn't get anywhere with them. Hmm. So um, this year there will be jury trials, probably three altogether because um, two of the cases in Texas will be combined. Um, so three altogether in which juries will convene just to decide how much he owes the family in damages. Hmm. And yeah. In terms of how the legal process, both in that case and in his custody battle, forced right. him to make, so you talked about his sincerity earlier. Yeah. He made certain statements in depositions in both cases that kind of undercut his brand. Can you talk about that? Sure. Do you mean the psychosis statement or? Do well, you there's mean... both. There's the psychosis and yeah. uh, oh, then also that was a deposition. And then another statement by his lawyer characterizing him as uh, just an entertainer who's. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So his lawyers thought that the best path in the custody hearing and just to recap very briefly. Um, so he has been battling his ex-wife in court um, for years. Um, they were divorced in 2013, I believe. Um, and so almost for the duration of what he's been doing on Sandy Hook, he's also been simultaneously battling his wife on various fronts, either over money or over custody of their children. Um, this first uh, really pivotal custody battle was um, he had initially had sole custody of the, of the kids. And so she was fighting for at least shared custody. Um, she had had some um, emotional difficulties and he's, he leveraged those and got um, sole custody. So now she was battling for shared. Um, he just couldn't get out of his own way. And this is kind of what happens to him time and time again. You know, he would roll his eyes in court. He would, um, he would tell the, her lawyer that he didn't trust him. He would, um, he would make noises that were strange. He, he just, he was completely contemptuous of the process. Um, and so she won, she got shared custody of the kids and she became sort of their primary residence. But you see this replay itself over and over again. One of the things that's so aggravating to him was Lenny's efforts to get content taken down or others, you know, he had to do a retraction on Pizzagate, for example. When people first start challenging him, he goes into a fury and then he digs himself in deeper. You know, he um, was displaying uh, Lenny's, you know, addresses associated with him and his family online. You know, he just starts digging deeper. The same thing with Neil Heslin. You know, he would start to say, um, you, well, how could he have held his son? That was Neil Heslin's claim when he had an interview with Megyn Kelly. How could he have held his son after his death? Um, I thought that the, you know, the coroner said that they, could, they couldn't hold their kids. Um, so he, here he is you know, on his show doubting um, a father's last memory of being with his son. 
And then when that content got taken down, he went crazy and said, you know, I'm only asking questions and he should come on here and prove himself and, you know, using his name over and over. So he really hates that kind of challenge. He sees it as an infringement on his rights. And so he just goes even more bananas. And so consequently, you know, in the legal proceedings, as on his show, he ends up digging himself in deeper. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned the damages trial that's coming up. Do we have yeah. any idea about how much Jones could be on the hook for and whether it could really damage the empire of conspiracy theories that he's built? It's really hard to know right now, Adam, um, but there have been some documents that have begun to come out because this document quest continues. So now, you know, the, the depositions and, and the court orders are geared toward, you know, compiling something that juries can look at and determine, you know, well, what is he worth actually? And so what could we award and have a reasonable chance that the families would collect? So, um, there are some documents that suggest that and in two of the years, I think it's 2015 and 2016, at the height of his conspiracy, conspiracizing around Sandy Hook, um, he was grossing around, um, it was $75 million a year, um, which is you know pretty serious um, when you consider that he's always tried to portray himself as a struggling mom and pop kind of business. You need to buy more of his um, diet supplements and and you know his products, his sort of doomsday prepper merchandise, so that you can keep the place afloat. Um, but actually, he's doing pretty well. Thank you very much. So they're trying to figure out. You know, uh, it, he he maintains that okay, there's this gross, but I owe money to this business and that business. It's a whole uh, web of companies um, with money flowing between them that the lawyers are right now trying to untangle. Mm. And what years were this? Was this around the time that around former President Trump 20, went on the show? Or Yeah, yeah, it was around that time, uh, 2015, 2016, and maybe 2014. Um, but right. that was, and yeah, that was around what, what he, was, um, he was bringing in. And your protagonist, uh, Lenny, uh, he yeah. wrote a letter to former President Trump about uh, how that legitimized these conspiracy theories that damage his, his, the families of Sandy Hook and never got a response to that, right? That was, um, yeah, the town of Newtown actually wrote uh, to the president and asked him to disavow the theories that Jones, not only to disavow Jones, but to disavow the theories about Sandy Hook that he had been spreading um, and got they got no response. Yeah. Um, it really worried them that, um, you know, uh, Trump had gone on Jones's show, you know, right before he clinched the nomination um, and he was, uh, he was really, they were really concerned that this would bring a whole new wave of conspiracy theorists into Newtown because, you know, not only the families, but the residents of Newtown had been really tormented by these people. And of course, that act brought a lot of conspiracy theorists in from the cold and into something resembling the political mainstream in a way that continues to this day. To to what extent does the does do the Sandy Hook families uh, lawsuits and journeys provide some sort of roadmap for holding both him and others accountable as we deal with these conspiracy theories and online misinformation? Um, they have been remarkably successful. Now, whether this success is owing to, again, Jones's inability to get out of his own way and his status as his own worst enemy, um, because he does tend to obstruct the legal process. It makes him paranoid to reveal information about himself. Um, is that gonna work with other conspiracy theorists? It seems that um, there are a lot of tools in the toolkit. So Lenny sued James Fetzer, the PhD that we talked about a little earlier, um, the University of Minnesota professor um, in 2019 and got a judgment 
um, against him. And they did that by limiting um, his ability to sort of trumpet these theories in court. So they, they obtained a summary judgment and then they went to a jury trial for damages, much like is gonna happen um, for Alex Jones. So it does seem to be a good and creative way to bring these people to heal. Um, mm. But they're, you know, it's like whack-a-mole, right? Um, right. You can do sort of the biggest fish in this pond, but there's a whole lot of minnows that will come swimming up. And, mm. you know, they can be, in many cases, they can be as pernicious and as um, as troublesome to the families as, as bigger people like Alex Jones, who, by the way, at this point, Alex Jones hasn't talked about Sandy Hook in years. So it has really silenced him on that yeah. at least um you know he'll he's crazy theorizing about um cons uh, about uh, coronavirus and and the election but um but it did succeed in um in stopping him from theorizing around sandy hook and that has brought some relief to the families they they live quieter lives now than they did even when i started reporting this book mm. um your book also mentions another analogous uh, litigation, include which was Deborah Lipstadt, uh, Lipstadt's uh, litigation with David oh. Irving, uh, yeah. how she defended herself and won in court uh, over Irving's Holocaust denialism, and yeah. how even though she defeated him and had the court essentially uh, expose him as a denialist crank there was a sort of uh, mixed legacy in the age of the internet about the trial record. Can you talk about that? Sure. So when I first started reporting this book, David McCraw, our newsroom counsel at the time said, you know, I just feel like there's a parallel here um, with that whole trial, the David Irving um, trial. And that was him suing Deborah Lipstadt saying that she had um, libeled him in, um, and he sued her in a British court where the burden of proof is um, is on the um, the defendant. So you you well you have to. I won't, I won't get too much into the weeds here, but um, it is a more difficult bar um, for the person being sued. Um, it's it's easier for someone to get a judgment in Britain than than it is here in the United States, and so um, there they they did ultimately prevail. It was a resounding judgment that not only told uh, Irving because she had said he was a particularly dangerous Holocaust denier because he's an historian who twists the historical record in service to his theories. So that's what he sued her for. Um, she won. Um, there was a, a lengthy court record and a really long damning judgment. And so they decided to put all these materials onto one website so that this would, you know, put paid to Holocaust denialism. That was the thought. Here is this mountain of truth and mountain of facts that we've all uncovered. Because the trial was so involved, they had to really investigate some of these individual theories. So it really got to be pretty wrenching. And so they put all of these, these um, documents in one place and they said, this is gonna be the ultimate, you know, this is really gonna put paid to the idea of Holocaust denialism. And instead what happened was, even though some historians and journalists made good use of that material, the cranks, the deniers, you know, the hoaxers, the conspiracy theorists all dug through it. They looked for anomalies, they looked for glitches in the historical record, and they used it again to embroider their themes. And we've seen that in the post-election cycle too. And we have dozens of lawsuits uh, filed by Trump and his allies, all of them resounding defeats, and yet people scrutinize something in the record that may have been thoroughly debunked, but find it in isolation and, and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. To the kind one of hopeful thing, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, for you and I, like the one hopeful thing though, is once you get these people in a courtroom, the rules of evidence, as we'd hope, right? The rules of evidence actually do 
call an end to their theorizing. I mean, they lose, they have nothing. They don't have evidence. They don't have proof that stands up before a judge or jury. So that's the saving thing. The records, unfortunately, yes, like records everywhere, they end up being used um, to, to bad end. But, but being in a courtroom, I mean, having been there for the Fetzer trial, it's a pretty cleansing thing to have one of these nonstop carnival barkers you know, sit there silently and have someone tell their story and have them have to listen to it. So it, that, that, is a pretty, uh, that is a pretty great feature. And it is sort of the one place where these families have gone for relief and gotten some measure of it. Mm. Uh, will you be at the damages trial, any of them? Yeah, yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. That's uh, gonna be interesting. To end on a kind of recent note, uh, there was a settlement by Sandy Hook families in very different litigation against Remington uh, yeah. and a pretty landmark settlement. Can you unpack that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I didn't cover this uh, trial very much, but, um, but have written about it in the context of these other legal victories that they've been winning against Alex Jones. But um, this was a, um, a story that I, I sort of dug into it for just a, um, a piece that is running in the paper tomorrow. Um, it was a, so there was a 2005 law that grants pretty broad immunity from lawsuits to gun manufacturers, um, really limits the ability for anyone to sue them in the aftermath of gun uh, related crime. Um, but these lawyers in Connecticut started to explore a creative strategy. There are six exemptions or six exceptions to that sort of shield that these gun manufacturers enjoy, including one in which if the marketing of the weapon violates a state law, a state applicable state law, then a lawsuit can move forward. So um, it was a matter of trying to figure out, you know, it, how did they, they knew that these, uh, Josh Koskov, who was the lead lawyer in, the, in that case, um, he knew that this marketing was everywhere because he actually played um, Call of Duty, the, the combat video game um, with his kids. And so he saw the Bushmaster weapon in that. And they started looking at all of the ways in which Bushmaster or Remington advertised the Bushmaster rifle, which was used in the shooting. Um, and they were able to tie um, a lot of these loose ends together, this really macho advertising that was meant to appeal to troubled young men like the gunman at Sandy Hook. Um, and they were saying that this not only was irresponsible, but unlawful to market that weapon to a troubled young individual, that type of, of um, consumer um, without regard to what the consequences might be. Um, and so as they moved toward trial, um, the, the four insurers ended up settling for $73 million, which is uh, the biggest judgment in a gun related case like this um, to date. Mm. And one, I guess kind of broad question to end on and sort of where we began coming out of this book and the all of the research and everything you've done with it uh the with the subtitle with the battle over truth do you feel more or less optimistic about truth prevailing in a society that so treasures robust and free exercise of the first amendment I think that this book is a warning. I think that even over the course of writing it, um, three years, maybe four years, um, this environment has gotten so much worse. Um, the beauty of the main character, Lenny Posner, is that he saw from the beginning that the theorizing around Sandy Hook was not a one-off. It was not going to be something that went away when the battle over gun legislation in the aftermath of Sandy Hook started to fade. Um, that this was going to be a feature that um, 
uptake of social media among Americans was skyrocketing. This stuff was spreading like wildfire on the web. The platforms were doing very little about it. Um, and they were also beginning to use the First Amendment as a cloak for their own greed in that they were, you know, they wanted to keep building, they wanted to keep bringing people on so they could get their data and use it to sell them more advertising. Um, they weren't going to rein in this content and they weren't about taking people down who are bad actors online. Um, so he saw this and he saw how it expanded and you saw it happen in real time as this theorizing jumped from, you know, Sandy Hook to every mass shooting. Sandy Hook was the first mass shooting to create these viral conspiracy claims online. Then it was every mass shooting. Then it was Pizzagate. Then it was QAnon. Then it was coronavirus. And then it was the election. So just to watch that sort of conflagration spread over the course of reporting the book was really something and pretty dispiriting. But the good news is that people are studying it, that people are seizing on the urgency of this. Um, if I can add to that urgency and spur those really smart people who can find those solutions, including our legislators who can then, you know, use that expertise to try and craft better policy toward the internet, um, then that's the goal. So, and I do see a lot of work being done in that area and a lot of concern. And so I'm really hoping that translates into action. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your time. And uh, very, very, I really enjoyed the book and I really highly recommend it to listeners who are listening in right now. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Adam. I really appreciate your interest in this.